this is uh, pray let's, let's just commit uh, this day this class these all these classes into your mighty in in god's hands right let's pray father we we thank you for this day lord we thank you for your presence in our lives lord we thank you for leading us and uh, taking us further than we ever lord dreamed oh god and we we thank you that is uh, for the word which says that um, you always do god exceedingly abundantly all that we can ask or think lord um, lord i pray that uh, you will enable us to keep that in front of us always lord that um, no matter what god in whatever situation god you're you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think lord in um, difficult times god you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think and in times when we think that there are no answers that there is no way out lord you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think lord father we thank you in what seems to be impossible god in what seems to be impossible you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think and so god this morning i ask and i pray for uh, for each one of us here who have gathered lord i pray that you will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think oh god or even imagine lord and your word says it's according to the power that works in us the resurrection power of the holy spirit and, uh, and and that power is at work in us. The Holy Spirit is at work in us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Uh, can we just take this time to just go before God and say, Lord, um, this is my, you know, maybe there's one thing or some mountain-like thing which is before you or some great need that is there. Uh, let's take that to the Lord this morning and say, oh God, I have this need. Uh, here is this thing which is uh, just before me. Uh, here is this impossible situation that is before me. And I just pray and commit this into your mighty hands. I pray that you would come, that you would breathe life on this, that you would uh, put your hand on it and that you would uh, do the impossible, that you would do the miraculous. And uh, let's just declare and say, Lord, I thank you that you will do the uh, exceedingly abundantly above all that I I'm asking today, or I'm thinking today, or, or yeah, I'm imagining today, and because of this power of the Holy Spirit, according to the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, who's at work in us. You know, let's can we just take some time to do that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. We thank you. Oh, the most great is your power that is at work in us, Lord. The resurrection power that God that brought Christ from the dead, that is at work in us. Let's just bring our needs to the Lord. Um, you know, it, it needn't be one thing, it can be 10 things, but let's bring it to the Lord. Let's say, Lord, you touch, Lord. Lord, you provide, God. Your Lord, you heal, O God. Lord, you take care. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Exceedingly, God. Abundantly, God. Above all that I can ask today, God. Above all that I can imagine, oh God, yes, Lord, that's what you do, Father God. Oh, Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. I lift your name above every other name. I lift your name above every circumstance, God. I lift your name above every difficulty and challenge, God. I lift your name, oh God. I declare your name over every problem. I declare your name over every sickness. I declare your name over every stronghold, oh God. I declare your name, oh God, in what seems to be like impossible, God. I declare your name over every difficulty, oh God, for your name is indeed, oh God, higher and greater and powerful and 
more powerful and the most powerful name in the land, no most powerful name in the universe, oh God. Yes, Lord, every word says that at your name, oh God, every knee shall bow, every knee, oh God, at your name, every knee shall bow and acknowledge that you are God. And so we call upon that name. We, we, uh, we call upon your name, Lord, and we declare your name and we say in the name of Jesus, oh sickness, you have to bow your knee. In the name of Jesus, you mountain, do stronghold, you have to be come, you have to be, you have to come down in the name of Jesus. You change, you have you are broken in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, this impossible situation. I declare that you are made possible because of the Lord Jesus, because of the greatness of his the power of the of his Holy Spirit who is at work in me. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Praise God. God is good. And uh, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think or even imagine. Right? Amen. Okay. Um, so Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5. Right, Second Corinthians chapter 5. And... Um, we uh, we started the chapter and we went on till verse eleven. Right? So Paul is talking about um, about his life, about himself, and he says, you know, about his uh, about his body, about his life, earthly um, uh, home. He says, he compares it to a tent, and he says, you know, this has to be put away, this has to be put off. But if I put this off, we I have a building from God, a house uh, not made with hands, referring to. Uh, referring to the spiritual body um, that uh, all of us receive um, in Christ, right? Uh, referring to that, um, and so um, so he says, "This is what we have. This is what we uh, uh, we have access to." Right? And uh, and then we say, he, he also says, you know, in this body, in this physical body, there is all these aches and pains, and we groan. Uh, yes, there are there are weaknesses, all that. But uh, in that spiritual body, it is not so, right? Um, and uh, that mortality is swallowed up by life. So he says, um, you know, in this body, we groan, we have limitations, and and uh, we, you know, it's it's we, uh, you know, not because uh, we want to be unclothed, or we, not because that you know we want this to end, um, or we want nothing to do with our physical body, but that. Our physical body, our mortality, may be swallowed up by immortality. Right. So that is what he says: that this physical body would be swallowed up uh, by immortality, and uh, that uh, the spiritual uh, will, uh, that spiritual body, is, is something that I will experience. And um, and he also says that you know who has prepared us? It is the Holy Spirit. He has prepared us. He has given us a guarantee. That's verse five. And uh, so we are always confident. You know, if, when we are in the body, uh, in in one sense, we are absent from the Lord, and uh, but we are confident when we are absent from the body, you know, to be present with the Lord. And he says, so now we walk by faith. We have to walk by faith because we are walking in our natural bodies. We are walking on this earth, uh, walking meaning living, uh, uh, and uh, living our lives. Uh, simply put, uh, but he says that. Uh, but then we will live by sight it won't be by faith anymore because we will see eye to eye face to face right um so let's uh, start from where um uh, oh yeah um, also verse 9 so he also says that um, we make it our aim to be well pleasing you know we make it our objective to be well pleasing to god so whether we are present or absent you know we want to be well pleasing to him whether in this life or otherwise we want to be well pleasing to him and uh, and then he, he says therefore uh, you know uh, he talks about the judgment seat you know the bema and uh, we also saw that in in corinth there was this judgment seat which was a raised platform and where the magistrate would sit and uh, arbitrate between cases and uh, and pronounce judgment. Okay, so so he's saying that you know we all 
need to come before the judgment seat. And he's talking about all believers um, coming before the judgment seat, not a judgment of um, heaven or hell, but uh, uh, a judgment of the works and uh, rewards for those we have done, the, the things that we have done uh, uh, on, on the earth, right? Uh, in the natural, as we live this uh, uh, life, you know, the things that we did. And, and then... Um, so because we know the terror of the Lord, we know the righteous judgment of God, he says, we um, uh, we persuade men. We, we persuade men uh, for what? To, to receive the Lord, to receive salvation, to, to be saved. Right? So with the gospel, he says, we persuade men uh, so that their lives can be changed. Okay. So let's go to um, verse, 11, verse 12. Uh, let me just project the notes here. Okay. Yeah, I think it's coming up right. Fine. So let's read verses uh, 12 to 15. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer to those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who, uh, who died for them and rose again. Okay. So here, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you noticed in chapter, um, like chapter 3 onwards, right? Chapter 3, verse 1 also, he makes the statement, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Right? Do, do we uh, do we begin? I mean, I mean, do we have to start commending ourselves to you, recommending ourselves to you? So uh, the thing is that uh, the Corinthian church was probably, um, you know, in, in all strong likelihood, they they maybe they were uh, esteeming Paul and his ministry and his team um, lightly, in the sense they were not really. You know, uh, some of uh, you know, at least in the church, some of the people in the church, we see that um, um, you know maybe they they were not really giving him the due respect. They they were receiving others. They were receiving other apostles or other uh, you know uh, visiting ministers um, who were actually not ministering with the right motive, right? So motive. So we read about that also uh, at the end of chapter two. Right? He says, we are not as so many peddling the word of God, which means he's saying we're not compromising on the word of God. We're not uh, diluting the word of God. We are not as so many, which means that there were others who were doing it uh, in his time. Right, So others who were probably visiting Corinth, the church that he planted and, uh, and, and you know, ministering to them. And these people were inviting them Right, inviting them, receiving them, uh, and uh, and inviting and receiving them um, probably with greater respect and honor than they did with Paul, right? Because Paul would would could correct Paul would Paul would um, tell them that hey, this is wrong, and and so on, right? So um, so maybe they were receiving these people uh, and uh, not really you know doing the same, uh, not in the same way with Paul. So Paul writes, and, and he's, uh, so that is what we see, you know. Um, do we uh, do we not, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, uh, but give you an opportunity to boast on our behalf, right? And, uh, and it says that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Okay, so, so there are these people who are uh, boasting, and uh, who are boasting, uh, these ministers who are boasting in appearance, meaning that um, maybe 
uh, appearance is something superficial, right? In the way they looked, in the way they, maybe the, the way they spoke, right? Because Paul was not a trained orator, uh, like people of those times, right? They would uh, be very, very, um, uh, very articulate and they would speak in a very dramatic manner. And, and Paul was not like that. So, um, so therefore, you know, they probably esteemed him um not not really esteemed or not really esteemed him or gave him that uh, honor and respect that was due right so and not really received him right so um so he's saying well uh, who i'll have an answer that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart okay um so you have an opportunity you have a uh, 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 you know a, a chance to do this Right. Uh, and we also see you know, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10, gives us furthermore evidence that this was going on in their minds, that uh, this is what they thought about Paul. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 10, we see, um, uh, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Okay, so that is what they, um, they you know, uh, they thought about uh, Paul. And verse 9 says, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. You know, he was, he, he, Paul also says that he wrote this letter and uh, it was a very strongly worded letter uh, of correction and by which they, they, they were made sorrowful. They, and also uh, on his way to Macedonia, he, uh, it was an unplanned visit, uh, kind of a surprise visit maybe. But uh, he saw that some things were not in order and he had to correct what was going on, right? So, um, so they didn't like it too much, right? So he said, you know, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible, okay? So they're saying, he writes nice letters. They're all nice and strong, but physically in presence, you know, in, in physical presence, he is not so very impressive. His speech is also not very impressive. Okay, so they were not, they were actually giving a lot of weightage to outward appearance of the other speakers who would come. But they, he says, you know, um, who boast in appearance and not in heart, in the sense, they, inside, they were very different from how they were outside. Right? They were, uh, they could boast in the appearance, but you can't really boast, you know, they couldn't boast in heart. So verse 13, uh, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of a sound mind, it is for it is for you. For the love of God, sorry, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again so so what he's uh, Paul is saying you know if we did if we if we were beside ourselves meaning if we acted you know to be beside ourselves means uh, to be to be not your usual self you know to do something out of the ordinary to do something strange to do something radical right um so saying if we were beside ourselves or even you know to do something foolish Right. Foolishly, sometimes, you know, um, uh, foolishly brave or foolishly courageous, you know. So if we were beside ourselves, said it is for the sake of God. You know, we took those unnecessary risks. We, we, we took those, uh, um, we knew that, you know, like uh, uh, for Paul, there was this persecution and everything that was there in every city, but still he went, he still he ministered. Um, journeys were difficult and dangerous, but still he went. It is for the sake of God's kingdom. So he said, if you're beside ourselves, if you made such choices, it is for God. And or if we are of sound mind, the disciplined mind, it is for you. It is for your benefit, right? So when we took risks, it was for the kingdom of God. And when we behaved in a, in a very disciplined manner, uh, it is for your sakes. Right? We ministered in this manner and it is for your sake. Verse 14, for the love of God compels us. Oh, the love of God constrains us. You know, the old English says constrains us, meaning everything that we do, everything that we say, all that we are doing for the, for the kingdom of God, it is motivated out of love. It is motivated out of love. So the love of God compels us, guides us, uh, constrains us. 
right? It puts certain boundaries on us. We don't behave in a certain way because of the love of God. And we behave in a certain way because of the love of God, right? So love of God compels us um, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. When he rose again, we rose again, right? So he's saying that this is what happened. When he died, we all died. When he rose again, we rose victor victorious again, right? So, um, so, uh, so we have received him as Lord and Savior, and we should no longer live for ourselves. Verse 15, he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So our plans, our lives, uh, everything that we do is not for our selfish motives. We are motivated by love. Our, our motive, our reason for doing ministry and taking these, um, you know, the, these dangerous choices and decisions, it is motivated out of love. It is for you. And the way we live disciplined lives, it is for your sake, for your benefit. Right? And it is this because he died and rose again. Like in him, we died. And in him, when he rose again, we rose again. Right? We live. So therefore, the life that we live is for, for, for Christ. It is not a selfish life. It is a life lived for the Lord. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Okay, so what is he saying? He's saying, you no, know, we've come into a different spiritual reality. Okay, now we knew Christ in the flesh when he, you know, he says, uh, like the apostles, everyone, they, they knew him in the flesh, had face-to-face -face, uh, encounters with him according to the flesh right now we know him thus no longer okay one is of course he was not physically present but the fact is that something happened when he died and rose again that that was impacting them right? every believer so something happened that we also died and rose again that old nature died when we accepted christ old nature died and we now that our new nature, we have new lives, new nature, um, we have Christ in us. So we we also, we know him no longer in that manner, but we know him differently. So what he's saying is that because of that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, everything has changed. The way we look at God, the way we relate to God has changed, right? There is a new spiritual reality because of the new covenant, a new dimension, right? We know him us no longer we relate to him differently and uh, because of the new uh, new um, um, you know covenant and new life we also relate to people right so he says from now on we regard no one according to the flesh right? because now we are born again so we don't regard them out according to outward appearance we got we don't regard them outward uh, according to um you know according to their uh, according to their flesh out according to the outward appearance because now because of christ the way we perceive the way we relate to them all has also changed as also the way we relate to god has changed now how has it changed you know we have a closer walk we know that he indwells us that he's not distant Right, uh, we know that our sin has been taken away. Therefore, we are justified in Him, so we can approach Him boldly. So all that has changed. The way we relate to Him has changed. We don't relate to Him according to the flesh. Right. So therefore, our human relationships have also changed. It's not according to the flesh or human nature. Okay. Uh, it also means that um, you know we don't respond or react according to the flesh. Uh, you know, in our relationships with, with people. Right? They might, uh, for example, they might um, provoke us, they might persecute us, they might say things about us, falsely accuse us, but we don't relate to them in the flesh, in the natural. Like we don't respond or react. It, it could mean all, that also. We regard no one according to the flesh. Okay. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I think we've studied that word over and over again. That was, um, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become 
new. So we have become a new creation. The old things have passed away and the all things have become new. Verse 18, now all things are of God. Now these all things that have become new, they are of God. They are of God, meaning from God and through God himself, right? So the my spirit is quickened, is born again. This thing that has become new, it is of God. It is from him. And what has he done? Verse 18, second part, he is who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Okay, He has reconciled us. He has brought us closer. Um, he has broken down whatever was there as a, uh, as a, uh, as a blockage, you know, as, as something, as a barrier. He has reconciled. You know, what was broken, he has made new. And uh, the word is, uh, the picture that we have there is of, uh, you know, of a bone being set, a bone that is broken being set again to, um, uh, to, uh, to heal. Right, so it has been it's it's been set again. So we we are reconciled. Um, let, let me just take that word and uh, um, just one second. Um, okay, who has? Yeah, who has also given us the word of reconciliation he has given us the ministry of reconciliation okay so that word there um, meaning to um, okay. a, a great exchange that is done and to also to uh, to you know to settle that difference right to mutually settle that difference so whatever gap was there uh, whatever uh, thing was there, uh, the great exchange being done in order to settle uh, the difference. So, so we see that the Lord has done this. So he's saying the Lord has done this. He has reconciled us to Himself. He has He has bridged that gap, bridged that difference, um, and He has He has set that thing in place. What was broken, reconciled us to Himself. Not only that, but He has given us. The ministry of reconciliation, right? So what he did for us, what he did for us, he has given us the same kind of ministry, okay? The ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the word to himself, not imputing, right? Not putting on the, the uh, their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So this is what Christ did. He, he, he brought us all back to himself, reconciled us to God, um, and uh, not um, imputing our sins, not placing our sins, our trespasses, but uh, or treating us according to that, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So the message of reconciliation. So we not only we have the ministry of reconciliation, we also have the message of reconciliation. So we receive that. Okay. And um, um, yeah, and verse uh, uh, 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors, uh, meaning we are new creations, we are given the message, we are given the uh, ministry, and we are representatives, right? Um, the Sunday we were looking at, uh, you know, what is an ambassador, a representative, a senior representative. So a one who is a spokesperson who speaks on behalf of someone, on behalf of a nation, actually, who represents a nation and who speaks on behalf of a nation or a kingdom, right? So similarly, we are ambassadors, we are representatives. We are spokesperson for Christ. Right? You see, you know, it's a it's a great privilege. Right? It's a great privilege to speak on behalf of a nation. Right? It's a great privilege. It's a great responsibility, and it's a great privilege to do that. Right? So the to the highest office in the land, uh, maybe the you know maybe it could be a cabinet, it could be a president, it could be a minister, prime minister. So we. As ambassadors, an ambassador would take instructions and carry that out on behalf of a nation. So wherever he goes, it's like uh, you know he represents the nation. So if it's India and an ambassador from India goes to another country, it's as if India 
is he represents india they look at him as this nation india is saying this india is doing this so that is what you know that is what uh, that is how they see an ambassador right so it's a great honor it's a great privilege at the same time it's a great responsibility because whatever the ambassador says and does uh, is under a lot of scrutiny like the newspapers will report it right the ambassador from india did this your life is under scrutiny your life is also you know on put on display so they see the ambassador you know behaved in a very honorable manner or behaved in a very dishonorable way this he spoke in an honorable manner he spoke knowledgeably or he spoke in a very dishonorable manner so the the ambassador is always um, you know on display and uh, under scrutiny right they would they would very visible so it's a great responsibility as well so paul says you know we are ambassadors for the sake of christ as though god were pleading through us we employ you which is what exactly it is right they are taking the message going to the people as an ambassador as ambassadors so he's saying as though god were pleading to us through us we employ you on christ's behalf be reconciled to god okay be made right to god draw near to god be reconciled to god okay verse 21 for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him okay. this verse also you know like verse 17 we have studied this over and over again um it says that he knew he made him like the lord jesus uh it says he made him who knew no sin so there was he was sinless he knew no sin he had no sin he carried our sin right he was he knew no sin he was made made him who knew no sin to be sin for us meaning he bore our sin right he literally identified uh, with it and carried it um and also bore the consequence of the sin on the cross in in that sense he became sin itself right he um he made him who knew no sin to be sin like he became that very thing um so he carried the sin he carried the consequence right of it he became sin he did this so that when we receive him as lord when we become new creations we might become the righteousness of god in christ okay it's a very powerful statement again a very powerful truth that in christ we become the righteousness of god we receive the righteousness of god we are clothed with the righteousness of god and that's how god sees us so made right with god right standing with god and also the very nature of god righteousness is something that he imputes on us in you know it gives us in the place of sin right so we have been made righteous made right with god acceptable god we have been made the righteousness of god in christ okay um so in verse 17 we saw that we have been made new creations right something that is new something that is fresh something that is unused and the word used there is kainos meaning a new something that is fresh and unused um, a creation a new creation so in in what sense in our spirit right we have come alive so that's why bible says we are born again right and we are dead to sin we are born again we are made alive and spiritually we are one with christ so um so paul uh rights and he declares this and he says you know this is the truth um so he starts by saying you know we don't we don't need to commend ourselves to you because this is our motive it is out of love the love of christ that compels us constrains us and so we move we go and minister we take certain risk for the sake of kingdom of god we make certain choices for the sake of kingdom of god and the way we behave it is for your sake that you be ministered to right and then he says um, and 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 all this reality is possible because he died and rose again so that because of that change he died and rose again you know we also died and rose again and therefore we don't consider anyone according to the flesh we don't regard anyone according to the flesh we don't you know even when we relate to christ it is out of this new born again nature 
that the reality which has happened uh, he died and rose, rose again so I, i i identify with that so i died and rose again so we regard no one according to the flesh and then he goes on to say if any man any man is in christ he is a new creation right if anyone is in christ he is a new creation this is the reality and he's a new creation uh, all things have become new the old things are taken away and um, and this is possible because of christ all things are of god you know it's come from him so this new nature is not man made right it's god made it's from him he's the source and he's the it is from him and it is through him in the sense he makes it possible it is not because of man's efforts it is not man made it's not because of man's efforts or performance it is through god okay um so the reality of that and 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 also the fact that you know verse 21 which is very powerful says that uh, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we may become the righteousness of god in christ okay so so the reality of that um then also he talks about the ministry of reconciliation the message of reconciliation that and the fact that we are ambassadors for christ and we have a great responsibility you know as new creations we have a great responsibility as new creations we have this wonderful message of reconciliation for the world and because we are representing as though god were reconciling the world you know the world to himself we implore right we beseech you we beg you be reconciled to god so um, that's chapter 5 okay so let's uh, move on to chapter 6 now any questions here anything any verse that you need an explanation or any um, questions uh, in this section anything at all before we move on to uh, on to chapter 6 is there anything that um okay um okay right so second corinthians 5 you know the context okay it's it's clear okay great um so the the context of all this you know we we need to understand he's talking about um, you know uh, the a lot of revelation you know a lot of spiritual truths uh, is sharing um, uh, in the meantime you know, the he, he, right when uh, he says this is how we are okay about the ministry uh, this is how we are this is how we look at life this is how we look at death this is how we look at you know the life after right all that comes in chapter 5 you know um so chapter 4 we do not lose heart and all that so he's talking about how he he his ministry team you know um when they serve god this is how we serve, this is how they serve and so and and here here and there in the middle we see that paul is saying you know um uh, therefore you need to change your outlook about us you know like he says we are not like them right we are not like um the others who boast in appearance but not in heart and so on so saying you know we give you an opportunity to boast about us right and um, and and all that so um so he's also clearing up certain things um is it's drawing a parallel between him the ministry team and also other a parallel as in sorry comparison parallel it's not parallel it's comparison so he's saying okay um you know this is how we are uh, this is how the other ministers are uh, who are you know whom you are entertaining you know it's not he's not talking about all the other ministers but some of them right because he would recommend timothy he would recommend titus he would recommend apollos um to various churches you know when we read his ep- uh, apostles we read i mean when he read his epistles sorry we re- we read about that you know how he recommends certain ministers so there were some he did not recommend uh, he does not name them uh, but of course he wants um in in some of his letters he wants people of you know some he gives some names and he says okay uh, you must be you know you must be careful of his words he has done much harm right uh, you must be careful so uh, so this is uh, something that he did so here in corinth specifically he is um, comparing to certain people who visited corinth and who ministered there and who were whose motives were not actually clear 
you know motives were not clear in the sense they were not sincere right in their ministry so he's uh, he's is saying you know this is how we are this is our life this is how we lived okay okay um okay let's move on to chapter 6 okay i yeah i just minimized it kiran so you won't be able to see now you can see it okay chapter 6 let's read uh, uh, first uh, few verses we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of god in vain for he says in an acceptable time i have heard you and in the day of salvation i have helped you behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of god we commend ourselves as ministers of god in much patience in tribulations in needs in distresses in stripes in imprisonments in tumults in labors in sleeplessness in fastings by purity by knowledge by long suffering by kindness by the holy spirit by sincere love by the word of truth by the power of god by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left by honor and dishonor by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well known as dying and behold we live as chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things okay so uh so you know in in these verses um uh, he's of, of course by by starting uh with an exhortation not to receive the grace of god in vain okay so he says that uh, even in the you uh, know in, in, in 1 corinthians 15 like he says by the grace of god i am what i am okay and his grace towards me was not what in vain it was not in vain in the sense he gave me this grace he extended his grace to me and that grace uh, when he extended it was not in vain it was put to good use how was it put to good use he said you know i labored more abundantly than the others i worked more abundantly i labored i put in more effort he says right because of this grace of god and he says that also uh is the grace of god it was the because of the grace of god so um so the thing is this here also he says you know not don't receive the grace of god in vain verse 1 right um so what what is he saying he's saying that you know when you receive the grace of god let it not be in a way let it not be wasted right god has extended his grace to you he has um, he has drawn you with his love and he's poured out his grace upon you and and uh, you have received that you know grace meaning um the unmerited favor of god what we did not deceive you know, uh, what we did not deserve yeah, you know the favor of god uh, he has clothed you with his favor he has uh, grace also is a divine character you know you have received that uh, you're growing in that uh, grace also means divine empowerment or divine enablement that is also there and grace also refers to the gifts you know so gifts he has empowered you enabled you he has uh, surrounded you with his favor he has given his divine character and power enablement so let it not be in waste like let it not be in waste um don't receive it in uh, in and let it not be wasted right for he says in an acceptable time i have heard you and the day of salvation i have uh, helped you right so what is it how can the grace of god be wasted okay uh, we can look at a few things here and uh, we might wa- wa- when we do not work hard to accomplish what god has called gifted and graced us to do so we do, when we do not work hard you know what happens is uh, you know we are excited no there's nothing wrong believers as believers we are excited when are we excited we discover the call of god oh we discover that okay god has called me for this god has called me to do this 
right? In in Acts chapter thirteen, so that was what it was, you know, for Paul. Paul actually started preaching the gospel right from the time he he was born again, and you know, but his public ministry uh, we see really in Acts chapter thirteen, right? Uh, a coming together of uh, everything. So Acts chapter thirteen, we read about how they were ministering to the Lord, fasting and ministering and praying, and in the church in Antioch, there were these teachers, prophets, everyone, and Paul and Barnabas were also there. And the Lord separated them for the work of ministry. So I'm sure it must have been exciting you know, to hear from the Lord. Okay, now separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for I for the work that I have for them. You know, God is saying, I have a special work for them, so separate them. So people are prophesying over them, and hey, this is what God is saying, and it must be very exciting, right, to say. But the thing is that excitement is is good. But the fact is that uh, we we are excited, and after that excitement is over, we realize that now it's actually work. Okay, so it's time to train. It's time to prepare. Okay, so the excitement was there. Now the excitement is now there. Now we realize that okay, I need to prepare for what's ahead. I need to train myself. So uh, it would require some effort. Every training requires effort, requires change, right? A change in the way of doing things. Like uh, when you're training, you're, you change the way you're living your life. You know, there is discipline and maybe uh, it's, uh, you know, you do certain things at a certain time. You put in your time and effort for certain things. Now there is a, there is a change. Now, if you are unwilling to make that change, then the training is not effective. Right? And the grace of God is in vain. Then, after the training period, and when we are commissioned for the work, okay, what does it mean? So, training is over. Okay, been trained. But when it's, the, when it's time to start doing the work, okay, um, People give up halfway, right? And uh, and that that initial excitement and everything is because we realize that hey, it's hard work. We realize that uh, you know uh, it's going to take time. We realize that uh, things don't happen immediately, right? You need to put in hard work and uh, you need to continue on. So some give up halfway, right? Uh, like even in the first missionary journey. Right when we read, uh, we see Paul, we see Barnabas, and um, uh, and we also see their companion, who is John Mark. And uh, what happens? He actually leaves them and um, uh, and then goes. Right, uh, just trying to get that verse, Acts chapter thirteen. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 13, and uh, when we come to uh, verse 13, now when Paul and his party set sail from Paph Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Okay, John, who was with them, uh, he he just he just went back. So, um, and then we know, you know after the, when they are about to take on or go on their second missionary journey. So Paul says, right, uh, John cannot come with us, right? So because he left halfway. But praise God, he actually turned around, right? His life was turned around. He continued on in ministry, where Paul could actually, you know, looking back, say hey, um, he's useful in ministry, which means he continued. But then we know there are certain people who um, depart from the faith, even not just the work, but from the faith. Okay, why? Um, so Paul, Paul is, you know, warning and saying, you know, don't let this grace be in vain. Let it not be wasted. He has, he's given you, he's done so much, he has given for you. So, you know, you, you train, get trained, get commissioned. Don't, uh, even as you are commissioned, don't give up. Okay, Don't give up, don't waste uh, the thing. You need to put in work. Okay, so we'll stop here and then we'll uh, take a break. Um, and then come back at 10.